Workshop. Um, it is our pleasure to have Jessica Finson from University of Cambridge, Duke University, and IAS. Uh, she's going to tell us about representations of PID groups. Thanks. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak in this workshop. Uh, so this is a picture of the IAS lecture hall when I was there last, some time ago. Uh, it looks rather empty, so I guess I would stand at the spot where the picture is taken from if I was giving the talk in Princeton. But actually, it's it's a bit boring to look at empty chairs. And actually, I feel the same right now, looking just at black boxes. So I would appreciate if people could actually, yeah, turn on your video. I want to see people. I just arrived. Perfect, much better. And I encourage everyone to keep turning on your videos. Now, now I feel much better. Thanks. Um, yeah, I want to talk about representations of PRD groups today. So I want to shift a bit the types of representations that we are looking at that are slightly different from what we usually look at in this program. But I want to also show you some connection with modular representation theory of finite groups and how this plays into, into the representation theory of PRD groups. So for, for this talk, the notation is the following. F is a finite extension of QP or the raw C is our finite field. So I'm working with a non-Archimedean local field. That's what I mean by PRD group, the group over that field. And inside F, we have a ring of integers O and the maximal ideal P, and the residue field is denoted by FG. And so the main object for this talk is G, which is a connected reductive group over this local field F. And then I'm interested in studying these representations, and I want to construct all the irreducible, smooth, complex representations of this group G. Well, maybe I shouldn't say I, that's a really a big goal that a lot of mathematicians had and started working on more than 50 years ago, and we are still working on it. Um, and I mean, you know what irreducible means only so two sub representations, the trivial one and the representation itself. And I look at representations with either complex coefficients or I allow mod L coefficients in the spirit of the program. I want to look at modular representations as well, as long as L is the prime that's different from P the P that appears up here, the residue field characteristic. And smooth is a notation that, that gives us a category that's reasonable to study. So our periodic group G has a topology coming from the periodic field. And smooth means that every vector in our representation space is stabilized, is fixed by an open subgroup, an open compact subgroup. So these representations, they're usually infinite dimensional, but due to the smoothness assumption, they are something reasonable you can have. And so there are a lot of applications of this. For example, if you want to study a lot of things within the representation theory of PID groups, if you want to restrict representations to subgroups and study how they look like, like study distinction, if you want to study the Howard correspondence, if you want to write down character formulas, for all these things, it's helpful to be able to actually write down the representations to explicitly construct these representations. But also, if you want to go beyond, for example, if you want to write down explicit local Langlands correspondence, so attached to every explicit representation of a PID group, an explicit Langlands parameter, you need to know how to write them down explicitly. And then there are also applications to the global world, so to automorphic forms and automorphic representations. For example, in joint work with Sogu Shen, we prove that arbitrary uh, automorphic forms, almost arbitrary automorphic forms, are congruent to automorphic forms that are supercastellate prime, which then in turn has applications to the global Langlands correspondence. That would be a topic on its own. Uh, and there are more applications to chaotic automorphic forms, chaotic Langlands correspondence. And I put a dot, dot, dot here because I hope we can find many more applications and that list is not exhaustive. So these are just some of the motivations why I like to study these objects beyond just being a mathematician and being curious about how the representations look like. All right, so that's the goal, as I said. How do we approach this goal? So we know that there are building blocks for these representations. And in the complex world, they are called supercastular representations. In the mod L world, they're called castular representations. And the definition is essentially the same as for finite groups. So these representations are those that do not occur in the proper parabolic induction from the proper parabolic subgroup. Uh, and these are the building blocks because everything else can be obtained via parabolic induction from these building blocks. But these building blocks and supercastular castular representations, they are very mysterious and they are difficult to write down. And it took mathematicians a long time to 
be able to try to, to write them down and, and write them down an exhaustive list in, in some cases. So what do we know? So we know that um, the case in GLN is basically solved. So it started with work of Howe and Moy in the 70s. And I put again dot, dot, dot here because a lot of people worked on this and there's no way I can write down everyone. And then the story was essentially finished by Bushnell and Kutzka in 1993, where they provided a complete list of all the supercuspid representations. And then um, shortly afterwards, my friends in the showed that an analogous construction gives us all the cuspidal representations in the mod L setting. So blue denotes always the, the mod L setting. And it's, it's very similar, except the arguments are slightly more complicated to show that you get everything and that what you get is supercuspidal or cuspidal in the mod L case. And then shortly afterwards, well, not that shortly afterwards, about 10 years ago, 15 years almost, uh, Sean Stevens proved or showed how to construct all the representations of classical groups as long as p, the prime number of the, the residue free characteristic, is not equal to two. So classical groups are fixed points of an involution inside GLN, so um, symplectic unitary orthogonal groups. And then not that long ago, Grinchik and Stevens actually showed that the same construction works mod L to provide us with all the hospital representations in the model. And the case of inner forms for GLN was solved around the same time by Scher and Stevens. And basically the idea for classical groups and inner forms of GLN is to refer back to the case of GLN and make sure everything that we do for GLN is invariant under the involution of the haste well undertaken inner form. It's easier said than done, that's very complicated, but in some sense the language is always the same for GLN. That's for GLN. What I'm curious about is now, how can we go beyond GLN? Because if we want to look at all the exceptional groups as well, we can't really that easily go back to GLN. And so that's what I like to, to focus on in this talk. I want to tell you about the construction of supercuspular representations and also the mod L cuspular representations for general groups. So it started with work of how, uh, Moy and Prasad, sorry, in 1994, 1996. So you see this, the general theory started much later. And what they did is they defined an invariant that they attached to the representation, which they called a depth. The depth is either zero or it's a positive field number. And what does the depth measure? So I said the, our representation are smooth, which means that if you have a vector and look at a, um, the stabilizer, it contains an open subgroup. But this open subgroup, it might be huge or it might be very tiny. And so Moy and Passat, they define a filtration by compact open subgroup that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the depth measures how deep down in this filtration you have to go until you find fixed vectors. So it's somehow a measure of how complicated the representation is. And so what Moy and Passat did, or well, before I say what they did, let me complete the picture. I want to draw the prime number P in this direction, so two, three, five, and so on, because some results depend on what the prime number is. So I want to draw a picture here of what we know about the representation. And what Moy and Prasad did and Morris roughly around the same time is they studied all the step zero, these step zero representations here. So they showed that the depth zero representations are essentially the same as representations of finite groups of phi type. And that's where it comes in what I said earlier that the representation theory of chaotic groups is tightly linked to the representation theory of finite reductive groups and also in the model case. So that's where there are a lot of things that we've talked about in the special um, year program can become important for the representation theory of chaotic groups. But I'm also interested, or general mathematicians are interested not just to see what happens at depth zero, but also to understand what happens deeper down here at higher depth. And so the first construction was provided by Jeff Adler, the first general construction for general reductive groups in 1998. And JKU generalized this construction vastly a few years later. And these dots here, they denote all the representations that JKU constructs, which, which is based on Jeff Adler's construction earlier. And this is the construction that basically everyone uses nowadays. When I say that you need to know how to construct these representations to write down a link explicit lang -Lang correspondence, to study distinction, to study the Howard correspondence, to write down character formulas, people use these representations here, the representations constructed by JKU because that's the most general construction we know today. 
So you might then wonder, what do we get out of these constructions? And Julie Kim told us in 2007 that actually, if we are in this region here where the prime key is very large, then everything, every supercluster representation arises via use construction if the characteristic of this local field F that we're working with is equal to zero. So if we are looking at reductive groups over a finite extension of QP, everything arises from JT use construction. All right, so the question is, what happens if we are not in this region? And in 2014, Margrethe and JKU, they constructed representations that have smallest positive depths, which are these yellow ones. I circled them yellow. And they call these representations apipelagic representations. Why did they call them apipelagic representations? It's because Mark Reeder told me that he likes to think of a representation as one of these weird creatures that swim in the ocean. And our task is to find all these creatures, to find all these representations. And the representations that they found are those that are close to the surface, those that are in the region that can be reached by sunlight, and that region is called the epipelagic zone. That's why they call the representations epipelagic representations. All right, so, but I've circled yellow dots only in this region here where we had already blue dots. Why did I do this? It's because what Rita and you did is the following. They said, take a nice input, which is called a stable vector in the moi Passat filtration, whatever this is. And once you have the input, they perform a construction and the output are these epipelagic representations. But they could only show that the input exists in this region here, in this region where the prime key is large. So what I showed partially in a joint work with Beth Romano is that actually the input always exists if it exists for large primes p. So the input also exists for small primes p. That means we get new representations in this zone here for small primes p. These are representations that were previously not discovered by JKU. So that means there's something genuinely new there, something else we need to discover. And this is not just the case of small depths. There are more representations down here. There's a big question mark what happens here. And I hope that at some point I will tell you the answer to that. What I'd like to talk to today about is what we actually know. So this is the big question mark that we don't know yet that I'm working on. But if you look at this region here, you see there are a lot of dots here and there is no exhaust mark here. So maybe there exists a prime bound um, for the prime P just being large, not very large, where we get exhausted. And this is indeed the case. And moreover, I said that we get exhaustion if the characteristic of F is equal to zero, but it would be much nicer to have it for all periodic groups because why should we just work with local fields of characteristic zero? And the answer is we don't need to restrict to that case. It works in point generality. So let me write this down as a theory. Suppose that the group G splits over tame extension that's just because JKU works on that setting and a lot of mathematicians work in that setting because otherwise it's getting very difficult. Otherwise we are in this big question mark area. And assume that P doesn't divide the order of the while group, which is what I mean by P is large. So let me remind you the order of the while groups for classical groups are roughly n factorial. So that means you exclude all the primes up to n. And in the exceptional case, in the worst case, you exclude two, three, five, and seven, actually not that much. And under these minor assumptions, Everything arises from use construction. Use construction provides us with all supercluster representation. So actually, I had already announced this theorem when I was at the IAS last time, but I called it an expected theorem back then because I thought I had proven it, but I hadn't written down the proof yet. So I gave this talk. I was encouraged to talk about new things that might work, might not work. So I gave the talk and said, oh, yeah, I, I expect to prove that. But I afterwards tried to actually write down the proof. It, it seems not to be that easy anymore because I thought I'd just rely on the statement that exists in the literature and everything is fine. But then it turned out that when I read the proof, it doesn't work. And there's actually a counter example to the statement in the literature. So I had a pretty tough summer after my IES year uh, because I thought everything breaks down, nothing works anymore. But I guess the re <laughs> by the fact that I'm stating this theory now and also the fact that it was published this year, you can see I managed to fix it. I just had to write a new proof for the thing that I thought existed already in the literature to, to go a different way to actually prove everything. So I'm happy to now report that even though I mentioned this theorem already last time I was at the IES, 
now it's actually a theory, now it's proven, now it's written down and published. All right, so that's the complex story. I said that I want to also talk about the Mod L story. So actually the same construction, or not the same, an analogous construction works also in the Mod L setting to write, provide us with all the Caspital representations Mod L, so the, all the FL bar Caspital representation under the same assumption that P doesn't divide the order of the value. And while the construction is pretty analogous, pretty easy to write down, the proofs are slightly more complicated. I guess you all know very well that model representations are much more complicated than complex representations. As I said, we rely on the representation theory of finite groups, and there already you see that for complex representation, everything is pretty simple. In the model world, it's no longer the case. So these problems, they, they also, they all. They also bring a lot of problems with them in the mod L setting. For example, we no longer have the decomposition into Bernstein blocks, which I heavily used for, for this steering, which actually holds in a much more general setting than just the super All right, and maybe I should make another remark that I have this assumption on P large, which is actually not such a big assumption. But you might wonder, do I really need this assumption? The answer is, of course, there are these yellow representations here that don't arise from group construction. So yes, we need some assumption. And moreover, I expect the assumption to be optimal. Um, I put a little star here because I have to make it much more precise uh, if I want to make an actual statement. But the rough idea is it should be as good as it can be. So that means really new work is required. So this was the state of the art not long ago. This is, this is the picture we have. Except you who have seen my, my short postdoc talk might also remember that there was a slight twist in the whole story, which was that while I said use construction provides us with super custom representations that everyone uses everywhere, basically, I mean, those who want to work with representation of periodic groups, it turned out that use proof that the construction provides us with super custom representation does not work. Because JK use proof relies on the statement of Gerardin. And in this statement, the plus minus one was missing. And if you put this plus minus one, it's nothing else than a plus minus one back into it, the whole proof breaks down. It's so bad that, oh, sorry, I should say, <laughs> it's just the typo essentially in the reference. So it's not, it's not a bit, it's not really a big mistake. It's just relying on the wrong thing. But if you, if you put in the correct thing, it's so bad that actually there exist counter examples for the key ingredients in JQU's group. So it really breaks down. Uh, so that, that, was, that was a bit scary. Uh, so that kept us awake for some time, but we actually don't have to worry. The construction still works. So what I did is I took the first half of use proof of let's say the first 15 page, pages of his 30 page proof, 30 page paper, um, which don't rely on this typo. And then I added three pages in that don't rely on the typo either, the independent pages to complete the proof independently of JKU's second half. So overall, we have now a shorter proof and a correct proof that doesn't rely on, on the whole thing. So this now, this now is really the state of the art that's, that's the situation. All right, so that was the broad overview, just the telling you a story of, of what this, how the situation looks like, what we know, what we don't know. What I want to do next is tell you a bit about how we construct these super or capital representations, give you some explicit example that also shows how, it, how it's connected to representations of finite groups, and then give you a glimpse of how one can possibly prove the exhaustion um, of all the representations coming from use construction. And then if time allows at the end, I will tell you a small twist of the whole story as well. All right. So how do, or let me wait, see, are there any questions at this point before I, I don't see anything in the chat. So how do we construct these representations? So there's a two-step procedure. The first step is that we construct a representation, which I denote OK, of a compact subgroup. So for example, of SLN no inside SLN n. And then the second step is that we compactly induce this representation. So the second step is something well known. The question is how to do the first step properly so that the second step provides us with super the representation. So let me give you an explicit example. So I just moved up the, the two steps. 
that folklore conjecture that everything arises in this way. And so how can we do this in an example? So if we take the group SLN of our, our favorite local field F, we can take the compact open side group SLNO inside there. And now we want to construct a representation with either complex or ethyl bar coefficients. I call this field K bar the coefficient field. And so the way to one way to do it is we can take our compact open subgroup and map it down to SLN over the residue field. So this is now a finite group of meta, the reductive group of a finite field. And then we just take an irreducible custody representation of this representation of this um, finite group of, of meta. And so this composition now gives us the representation of the compact open subgroup. And so then the next step is just to compactly induce. So it's like the normal induction where we have that all the elements and compact open subgroup act via this representation. But compact induction means that all these functions should be compactly supported. And the action is just by a right cancellation. So that means this is this is the example of a depth zero representation. That means one important class of representation comes from these irreducible customer representations of reductive groups of our finite field. And you can do this either over the complex numbers or you can do it model. And from this, you also see that if you want to understand how, how representations that you could define over QL bar instead of C decompose when you choose the lattice, the L bar, and reduce mod L to F L bar, this question is very similar to actually the question of how do finite rep represent or representations of finite group of V type reduce when you reduce them mod L? How do they split up? Uh, so a lot of the representation theory of finite group goes comes into, into the game here. So this is one prototype, one example. Instead of SLN, you can take an arbitrary reductive group here. I took SLN just for simplicity to make my life easier. This is one extreme. Now I'm showing you a second extreme. And the general representations, they are basically taking both extremes and putting them together. So the second extreme is, again, I take my coefficient field to be C or FL bar and denote it by K bar. Now I want to look at the group SL2 for simplicity. And now I take a slightly different subgroup, which is slightly smaller. I take the compact open subgroup that has one plus the maximal idea on the diagonal, maximal idea in the upper right corner and O on the lower left corner. And these are elements of SL2, so determinant one. And I take plus minus identity in there just for technical reasons. Now I have to construct a representation of that compact open subgroup, and I want to construct a character, a one-dimensional representation. And so what do I do with the plus minus one? I just plan it one. I don't really care. You can do it either way. The interesting part is, what do I do with the rest? What do I do with this compact open subgroup? And so this compact open subgroup is not a random compact open subgroup. It's what I denote G sub X one half. It's a subgroup that appears in the Moiprasat filtration. So I should tell you a bit more about what is this. So what is the Moiprasat filtration? It all starts with the Gruet Tietz building. What is the Gruet Tietz building? The Gruet Tietz building is a lot of real vector spaces glued together. And in the case of SL2, these are all real lines that are glued together. So let me, let me just try to draw a lot of real lines that are glued together. So where are the real lines? This is a real line. This is another real line. So it's an infinite tree. And so Brewer and Tietz define this, this infinite tree or more general this, uh, uh, building for general groups together with an action of the chaotic group on it. And the way they define the action is so that it encodes compact open subgroups. So if I now take, let me take a different color. If I take now a point, say a point Y inside the building, if I have a point and a building and a group acting on it, I might ask, what are the points of the group that fix? What are the elements of the group that fix that point? And so in that case, this, so the stabilizer fixes it, uh, um, all the elements that fix Y. This just, in that case, is SA2 over the ring of integers. So that's the compact open subgroup we used on the previous slide. And I like to call this also GX0, uh, GY0, because it fixes the point Y, but in addition to fixing Y, it fixes also a circle of radius zero around Y. And the reason I use this notation is because instead of just fixing a circle of radius zero, I mean, 
which just means fixing the point, what you can do is you can fix larger and larger circles. Radius one, not radius two, not radius three. Okay, not the whole building. <laughs> larger and larger radii. And that's how you define a filtration. So if you fix, you look at everything that fixes, not just the point Y, but also a ball of radius one around it. What you get are all the matrices that have one plus P on the diagonal and P in the upper and lower right corner. And that's what I call GY1, fixing a ball of radius one around it. And if you remember from the previous page, if you look at this quotient GY0, what GY1, this is actually just SL2 over the residue field. And that's what we did on the previous slide. We took a representation of SL2 or more general SLNO by quotienting out this next group. So we're mapping it to SL2 over FQ, and then we took a representation of that. And so that's one thing you can do, and you can define the filtration deeper down, as I said. Instead of taking this point Y, we can also take a different point. We can take a point X here. What happens if you take the point X is that the first group, which is roughly the, the stabilizer, is X. This curve is in that case, oops, let's see the typo. It corresponds to the matrices with O everywhere except in the upper right corner. It's a bit smaller. There's a P. So this is GX0. And now if you if you go down the moi Prasad filtration, I said roughly the moi Prasad filtration means fixing larger and larger balls, um, but it's slightly imprecise. So the precise definition is slightly different, but just think of it as fixing larger and larger balls. And you see already that something at one half will change already. So what happens in that case is that at one half, you get a slightly smaller group where the diagonal is slightly smaller, while the off diagonal actually stays the same. So that's GX at one half. And then if you go to steps one, the diagonal stays the same. And now the off diagonal gets slightly smaller. So that's at depth one. And you can do this at arbitrary depths. You can keep going. If you keep going, what happens is that alternatingly the diagonal and the off diagonal changes. And the idea of the micro side filtration is that to each point you can associate such a filtration. And essentially for SA2, the two types of filtrations you get are these two. And they have a lot of nice properties. The quotients are particularly nice, and they are used in the construction of supercustom representations. And you have seen already this that we used this quotient here in the construction for depth zero representation. And now the second example I want to show you, I want to start now with this group, the one half group. And now the natural thing would be to just model out the next group here. And so that's what I'm going to do. And then in general, you will have to work with deeper filtration and slightly more complicated. So that's the idea. So I'm now mod out by the next filtration subgroup. I call it here one half plus. The plus just means the next one, which I call one at the, at the, pre the previous page here, one. Because here, you can define it for all real numbers, all positive, non negative real numbers. Uh, but all the ones in between one half and one are the same as the one at depth one. I'm not, not writing them. They are always the same. So we quotient out by, by this next group. What do we get? We just get F2 on the off diagonals. And now we need a character. So what do we do? We can just take a matrix AB on the off diagonal, send it to A plus B. That's an element in FQ. And now we can just send this to, to K star. So if, if Q was P, if we just had FP, we send it to the P suites of unity, which we can do in either C or F at bar, both fields of work. And now the magic is that if you take this character, if you take this composition here and take this character, and if you compactly induce this as on the previous page, we again form this compact induction where all these functions are compactly supported, we end up with a super cuspidal representation or a cuspidal representation in the model. These are actually a very special kind of representation. These are the ones constructed by Rita and you, these epiphylogic representations. Well, these are even easier, not easier, even simpler. Like these are the simple supercast representations that were previously constructed by Gross and Rita. And so I've shown you two types of representations now, and I hope that when you leave this talk, you have at least some idea of how supercast or custom representations look like. And the general representations are made out of these two types. You have the depth zero representation that I showed earlier. You have these representations that correspond to characters. And what you do in general is you take a depth zero representation and a bunch of characters 
for different subgroups, and then you put everything together to get a much more complicated compact open subgroup K with a much more complicated representation that you then compact from here. All right. Um, what I would like to do next is, so this is a rough idea of how we can construct representations. Next, I want to show you a bit how you can construct the input for this representation once you have the output to give you an idea how to, to prove exhaustion. And then, as I said, I tell you a slight twist of, of the whole story again. Let me ask if there are any questions about these explicit examples. All right. So I just minimized the, the previous page. That was the example we had. Now, assume we are given this compact induction. How can we possibly figure out what this K and the row K, what these two things were that went into the, the whole construction? So, so this, was, this was the input that we want to find. And we then you constructed this representation out of it, um, where this representation is the compact induction from this compact open set group. And now I want to go the other way around. So how do we go the other way around? So from this, from this representation, we can recover this real number R, because this real number is just the smallest non-negative real number, such that the representation pi that we are given has a non-trivial fixed vector under this filtration subgroup GX R plus. So this was the filtration subgroup GX one half plus, so G, GX one, because the way we constructed pi was by quotienting out this compact open subgroup and then inducing. So there's a fixed vector under this compact open subgroup. And this is the smallest R for this, for which it happens. So from, from this representation, we can recover this R. Once we have this R, once we know that this is one half, we know that we have to look at GX one half. And then we can look at how the representation acts there and we find the row K in there, the character. And so this way we can go back from, from the resulting representation to the input for the construction. And now the question is, how can we do this in more general? So the more general construction is slightly more complicated, as I said. Instead of just starting with, with one group, with the group I said too, we start with a whole sequence of groups, which is a twisted Levy sequence. So it's a, it's a sequence of subgroups that becomes, a Levy, that becomes a sequence of Levy subgroups over tangy ramified field extension. So it could be a twist of this Levy subgroup here, this sequence of Levy subgroups here. For and now, instead, and now as before, we need to take a point in the building. Um, that was the tree that I had before. But instead of just working with one real number, we work now with n real numbers, basically one for each group, except for the first one. And then we need a character, not just for one group, but for all these groups, except for the first one. So we have a lot of character, a lot of real numbers. And in the end, we also add the steps zero piece. And then, as I said before, the construction of these representations by U, which then yields a compact open set group and the representation of this compact open set group is a bit more complicated. So basically we take all these set groups, all these uh, twisted Levy set groups, take their corresponding subgroups of corresponding depths, take the characters on there, and then glue everything together, and then add on the depth zero piece on top. And then we get a compact open subgroup with a representation that we sli still slightly have to enlarge. And once we have done this construction, if we compactly induce it, we get a super cuspidal representation. Or in the mod L situation, we get a cuspidal representation. And now the question is, how can we prove that everything arises from use construction? And the way we prove it is, or well, the way I prove it, I should maybe say first, the way Julie Kim proves it is very abstractly using the functional formula and things like that, and showing that um, a measure one subset set of representation satisfies everything it needs to satisfy, so the super cost representation. The way I do it is much more explicit. So basically by imitating this error here, but it's getting much more complicated. But the first step is the same. The first real number is just the depth, which is the smallest non-negative real number such that our representation has fixed vectors under the next filtration subgroup. And that's what already Moy and Pastat did. They defined the steps. And so the nice thing is now, now that we have this, so we take our representation space and we look at these fixed vectors and we know that this is, this is non-zero. 
And so we can get some information out of that because what do we have on this group? We can act via the R1 filtration subgroup mod out by the R1 class filtration subgroup. First, this filtration subgroup acts trivially. So this quotient will act on this vector space. And what is this quotient here? I said the Moipasat filtration is really nice. The zeros quotient, this is the finite group of Lie type. That's the depth zero story. That's where we get back to representations of reductive groups of a finite field. But as long as R is positive, so in the case that R1 is greater than zero, it's even easier. In that case, this quotient here is just a deal. So we have the two cases, the depth zero case, where we need to rely on representations of finite group of D type, and the greater zero case, in which case this group is abelian. And now, as you know, if we have an abelian group acting um, on some vector space, this decomposes into characters. And we just pick one of the characters, and that's how we obtain a character, which I denote by one. So that means we know that inside our representation, this GXR1 acts by a character that's trivial on GX on one plus, and we call this character phi one. And that's what already Moy and Prasad did, um, which they called an unrefined minimal K type. But this only gives us this, this group and the R1 and phi one, but we need all the other information there. So my idea was essentially to not stop, but keep going. And so what I did now is I restricted the representation to, to a smaller group, G2. And what's the smaller group? It's this group here that we need to find. It's roughly the centralizer of this phi one. It's a, just the Levy subgroup, so Levy subgroup after some field extension, on which this character phi one essentially doesn't tell us anything. So this character has a certain depth, um, depth R1, but on G2, this character is essentially trivial. So that means on this group, G2, we don't have much information yet. And so I restrict the representation to this group. And since we know it's trivial of depths R1, we can also look how, how deep in the filtration we have to go down to find fixed vectors. And that's what I call an R2, the constraint depth for this restricted representation. It's not that easy because when you try to find this R2, you have to be very careful not to destroy that actually the original group of depth R still acts via this character phi one. Uh, so it, it's all a bit difficult. So it's it's easy to, to show that this R1 exists. It's much more difficult to show that this constraint depth R2 exists. But the main idea is to just keep going. And once you have this R2, you can look at how does G2 act on the representation restricted to, to depth R2. And that's again a character as before. So that's a character phi T. And once you understand how to play this game, you can just keep going, find the next group, find the next real number, find the next character. You have to do it very carefully to show that these characters have nice properties so that in the end this construction works. And then at the end, you end up with the last group and a depth zero key. So there, there's a lot I could say about this. And as I said, it's much more complicated to construct the letter than the former, but let me not go into the details. If anyone is interested, I can say more about it. But I hope what you should get out of it is just that you basically can, starting with the representation here, can get the input by stepwise trying to get the input back by doing some a generalization of more um, Prasad's construction. All right. So that's how one can prove exhaustion. Um, so what I would like to do next, uh, maybe I just check, are there any questions at this point? All right. Uh, what I would like to do next is come back to, to this result that loose construction works. So I said, I proved that everything, uh, P is large enough, everything arises from use construction. We saw use construction the proof didn't work, but we saw that we can fix it. So indeed, we now know that use construction yet yeah, super custom representations or custom representations in the mod L case. And these representations are all of this form. They are all compactly induced from compact open subgroup to the whole group, as the full group conjecture predicts. But for some applications, it's really, really sad that the key ingredients in JKU's proofs don't work. So I, I wrote down the proposition numbers, but it doesn't really matter what the numbers are unless you want to go and look them up. These are some intertwining results that, that are really important for other things in, in, in the study of representations of chaotic groups as well. And 
So that was one motivation for my and joint work with Tasha Kaleta and Lauren Spice. We tried to make this, this intermediate step work again, these proposition 14.1 and 14.2. Uh, that's not all of the motivation. I'll say a bit more in a second, but let me first say what we did. So I said that there was the plus minus one missing in Jardin, which made the whole proof of JKU break down. So one natural idea is, why don't we just put the plus minus one back in? And that's what we did. We said, we showed there exists a character, just the character from this compact open subgroup to plus minus one, just the quadratic character, which sounds very easy, but it takes us 30 pages to prove that it exists. So it's not as easy as it seems, such that if we twist this representation by that you constructed by this quadratic character, so add in a plus minus one, then use proof works, use proposition 14.1 and theory 14.2 work, and everything looks fine again. Okay, you might now wonder, why did we care? Because I proved already earlier that use construction works. My proof here is rather short. It's like the first half of use paper and then three additional pages. While this proof that use construction works or twist of it works means you take the 30 pages of you and you add another 30 pages of us to it in which we prove that the plus minus one exists. But so the reason why this is so important is because we actually think that this is much more natural to look at this, this twisted construction here instead of the original one, because it resolves a lot of problems that, that were observed in mathematics before. And a lot of cases when people try to write down an explicit local Langlands correspondence in special cases, for example, or when people try to write down and uh, construct the local Langlands corresponding using geometry and try to match it with used construction, people had to add a plus minus one there. They ha had to add a twist in, in it. And this twist looked different in all the papers. And it made us think, so maybe, maybe used construction is not the natural one. Maybe there's a more natural one. And so we hope that our construction is actually more natural construction. And the reason, oh, sorry, I just, so that means these are indeed super custodial. And so the reason why this is important beyond just believing that it's nicer is that it allows us to prove a lot of things. So for example, Lauren Spice, he had a way of writing down character formulas for supercastle representations. So he has a paper in Compositio where he writes down a procedure to calculate these character formulas. But he made an assumption in there and he had the assumption that a certain character exists, a certain plus minus one. And so our theory in five now shows that this quadratic character actually exists. Um, so that's one thing. That means that now with our result, Bern Spice is able to calculate the character formulas. Another important thing is that Tasha Kaleza, he tried to write down a local Langmans correspondence for non-singular representations. So a large class of representations that is particular as non-singular. Um, so basically I've, I've told you the representations um, of periodic groups correspond to representations of finite group of Lie type, and so in the Lustig have a notion of non-singular, and that's related to this notion. And these representations, they correspond to all the, the supercustodial Langlands parameter. But in order to write down a correspondence, Tasha Kaleta had to get rid of a quadratic character. There was an abstraction to it, which was a quadratic character. But he, so he had to show that a quadratic character exists in order to get rid of the, of the abstraction. And this theory in five, again, allows us to show that the quadratic character that, that Tasha Kaleza needs actually vanish, I mean, that it exists so that the abstraction vanishes. And that's actually how we started. Lauren Spice had something that, a plus minus one for which he needed a quadratic character that extends it. Tasha Kaleza had one for which he needed to extend it. And the initial character that each of the two wrote down didn't really work, they couldn't extend it. And so then the observation was, hmm, maybe if we multiply them, things work out. And, and that's how, how a, lot of, a lot of the ideas were coming from. The hour plus minus one makes now all these abstractions vanish. And moreover, it allows us also to prove character identities for the local Langlands correspondence in the regular supercustodial. All right, I think I, I have a few more minutes. Let me ask that this, if I can say a few more words about the precise statement of this character, but let me ask first, are there any questions?
Okay, then let me let me use the last five minutes uh, to just make the statement more precise. So, so give you an idea of what, what this is about. So the setting we work with is just for simplicity, let G be an adjoint group, M a twisted levy subgroup. So a subgroup that becomes a levy over some time extension. And then what we also assume that P is not equal to two, but that's what JKU assumes. And we take a point in the word sheets building of M, which embeds in the word sheets building of, of the group G. And so then the statement of the theorem is that there exists an explicitly constructed sign character. And what is it a character of? It's a character, this MX. What is MX? X is a point in the building, and MX is all the points of M that fix the point X. And this character factors through this MX mod MX0 plus, where this is the first positive filtration subgroup and the more facet filtration. And so what is this group? So this group here, these are the, the FQ points of a reductive group. So we are back to representations of finite groups of Lie type. And this is usually disconnected. And the fact that it's disconnected made it actually so much more difficult. It was much easier to show it for the connected piece than for the disconnected piece. So this, even though I say reductive, I should say a possibly disconnected reductive group. And so, so how do we define this character? What character do we need? This character is determined by the following property. Let me first say basically the explicit version and then say in words roughly what it means. So we want that for every chain maximal torus of our PRD group M, such that the point um, X is contained in the apart on the Bruet sheets building of T, which in the special case corresponds to the apartment, but we look at more general torus. We want that the restriction of this character to the intersection of this torus with the group M X equals a given quadratic character. And this is the given quadratic character that was described to us essentially by, by all the obstructions that appeared. Uh, so this is this is a rather natural character that, that appeared. And so what is this? So that means, in other words, that we want to find a character of a reductive group, a non-connected reductive group, a plus minus one equality character. And what we know is what this character is supposed to be on all, first of all, all the tori, because this intersection recovers all the tori of the group, but much more than that. Since this torus might be very ramified, these Inter this intersection might not be a torus. It might be just, it might, for example, just recognize the disconnected part. So that means we have a reductive group, disconnected reductive group of a finite field. We know what the character should be on a lot of the elements for each torus and the tori that might lie in there in various different ways. And so the, the miracle is that all these plus minus ones that are given to us all fit together to build this global character, the character of the whole group. And the way we do it, just in words, is we, we use the, we, this is the character that we want from each Torah. Right? We decompose this character into three completely different pieces that are not related to these pieces here. And then you use three different techniques. We, we use the moi facade filtration, um, we use the spinner norm, we use the um, we use hypercomology and we use the explicit action of the groups on more facade filtration in order to construct an explicit character. And so in the just remaining one minute, no one to scare you off. I just wanted to give you an example of how these characters look like. Um, so as I said, these characters are some somehow arising natural naturally. Uh, and the way why they arise uh, you calculate them on a torus. Um, you can look at the root groups corresponding to the torus. Uh, you, you pick out certain root groups. There are certain, um, certain specifications that tell you which root groups to pick. Um, and then what you do is you just evaluate the, the root on, on the element, on the same symbol element, and then obtain an element of a finite field and take the sign character of the finite field. Or in cases where there's a lot of symmetry and you know that you end up in the norm one elements, you take the, the sign character on the norm one elements. 
Um, but I, I just wanted to show this in case people are interested. I don't expect you um, to digest all the details now, but I'm happy to talk a bit more later. But I think my time is up. So let me, oops, let me move. Do you still see the slides? <laughs> Sorry, for me, everything moved down the, um, the screen. So uh, this is just the last slide, which is just says it's the end of the talk, but only the beginning of the story, because there's much more I can tell you about. But I think my time is up, so I stop here. Thank you. OK, Len, let's thank Jessica for the beautiful talk. Are there any questions? Uh, Jessica, yeah. can, you, uh, uh, can you show us one example of this? Uh, uh, quotient MX by MX uh, zero plus and and the character epsilon X. Can you show us one example? Uh, um, it's a rather complicated construction, so it's it's not so. So so um, what kind of quotient you get here? You said that you're a reductive group, but uh, it's a yeah. So, so uh, show us one example, like uh, how does this quotient look like? Oh, so um, for example, one uh, one example that doesn't necessarily appear in in, a, um, in that setting, but we have seen earlier the construction of SA two. So if S M would be SA two, then this SA two X that would be, um, in this case this would be just SA SA two of O. And this would be just these, oops, these matrices, this P on the diagonal one. Oh, sorry, not P. One plus P on the diagonal, P off diagonal. And so this quotient, the whole quotient, this would be just SA2 over FQ. Um, but in general, what, what, what rather happens is that you don't have the group SA2, but you, usually G is something larger, say, G could be symplectic or general in a group of, of much higher um, dimension. Uh, and then the levy might be something like SA2 times some torus in there, um, because this is usually levy. So you will usually not have a semi simple group, but it's usually a reductive group with a non trivial torus. Uh, and then you might have also, as I said, it might be disconnected. So for example, um, if you take PGL2 and take the Barry center, you can cook up a disconnected example, but that would be still easy because it's just the tourist. So um, it's, it's more complicated to cook up examples on the spot, but uh, the essential idea is you could basically get uh, almost everything you like here. Um, it can get arbitrarily complicated. So this is in this, yeah, this example is, is connected, but you can get easily disconnected examples. Thank you. Maybe one last word. So if you take PGL2 or take the Barry center, what happens is that um, you, if, if you look at the building, what happens is that you have the element in the group that switches these two vertices. Um, and this element implies that we, that this quote, if you take the quotient at the Barry center of MX, not MX0, there will be an order to uh, so the, if you take then the component group, it will have order two, so that will be something disconnected. Are there any other questions? Um, if no, let's thank Jessica again.